Okay. Uh, I always use a lot of effort that may be more than needed, especially when I try to focus on something, how to find the balance between viriya or effort and relaxation. Well, this is um, a point that I, I made during uh, one of the meditation sessions um, last night, I believe, and and that is the uh, the skills that we develop during the meditation are, are life skills. They are applicable to situations um, outside of the meditation room, off the meditation mat. And so the, I think everyone has, has a problem in this area to one extent or another. It's like um, finding a balance between effort and relaxation. How do you do that? Often uh, effort means stress and tension and builds up to a climax and then one finds a release um, in often unsuitable or uh, unwise ways and they have the cycle that per perpetuates itself. And so when we, when we put effort, there's no relaxation and we relax, there's no effort. Now, why the breath is, is such an um, excellent object of meditation is because it's completely uninteresting. I mean, why would you, why would you be interested in your breath? I mean, it's... Um, <clears throat> now, we'll, most people can watch a, a movie or sit in front of a screen for an hour, two hours, three hours, even longer maybe, um, and not find it particularly difficult. But the problem is that when we are focused on an, a screen, there's no real effort involved. The, the content, the, the sounds, there's the forms, there's um, the interactions taking place on the screen produce emotions. There's a story, there's a narrative, there's something that carries us along with it. So we don't need to put any effort in the spiritual sense into watching a movie or um, a, a play or whatever it might be. But if you watch your breath in the same way that you watch a movie, you'll soon fall asleep or you'll go off into some fantasy because there's not, there's not anything in the breath which is, uh, is drawing you towards it. So the only way that you can be with the breath is if you make a determination to be with the breath and if you make an effort to be with the breath. So you just can't be accidentally with the breath or, you know, just uh, like a fluke, um, except if you're having difficulty breathing, of course. That's another matter. So the, 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 the focus on the breath demands effort. Now, when we put forth effort into being mindful of the breath, if we put too much effort, then we get immediate feedback. This is a very efficient feedback system that we tap into in meditation. So too much effort, not enough relaxation, uh, you feel tight, tense, stressed, your breathing uh, becomes constricted, you may develop headache or chest pain. So you're putting effort in, too much effort, immediate feedback from the physical and mental phenomena that arise. 
if you don't put enough effort in and you're just sort of relaxing with the breath and in, um, then you either get um, swept off into a world of memory and fantasy or you fall asleep. So here again, this is the feedback. If your mind is caught up in the past and the future in memory and imagination or you're falling asleep, then you're, you're getting feedback, important feedback that too much relaxation, not enough effort. So how do you find what the, the balance? Well, being sensitive to the feedback that you're getting as you apply effort, whether or not um, there are these symptoms of tension and constriction, um, or whether the mind is uh, refusing to, to stay with the breath. So in meditation, to, to repeat, um, is a very efficient way of, of learning how to find a balance between effort and relaxation in daily life generally because you're putting yourself in a kind of a laboratory situation where you're applying a very specific kind of effort and seeing what happens and then ad adapting and tweaking your effort um, appropriately. Venerable Ajahn, you taught the method of zoom out, the breath through the whole body in sitting and to the whole movement of the whole body during walking. Can this whole be a consistency object like the breath in the nostril? But it's sometimes it's easy to get lost. Uh, I think with, with meditation, it's like never say never. It means like, you know, there are certain practices and certain uh, approaches which work for most people most of the time but never all of the people all of the time. And there's some things that work for very few people and very rarely. Um, so it's a matter of trying things out for yourself and seeing for yourself whether you are one of those people for whom like this whole body awareness of the breath or whole body uh, awareness of movement um, during the walking is a viable meditation practice? Does it lead to the abandonment of the hindrances? Does it lead to a stabilization of the mind, samadhi? So learning, again, this, again, this is feedback where we're getting from the body and the mind. <clears throat> um, So uh, the, in, in some ways, this uh, retreats are, you know, an opportunity just to try stuff out and, um, <clears throat> and, um, and see what happens. So I, I don't have that um, kind of confidence to say, you just do this and it will work. This is shortcut, you know, I guarantee. Well, I, what I say is, I think that this is a practice that, um, is in in harmony. It's not in conflict with the uh, more orthodox techniques that you can find or that are taught. But whether or not you'll have success with it depends on a number of factors, and uh, may or may not work. Um, but give it a try. So there's no um, absolute kind of answer. Can you make this your main object? This is what I understand by the question. Can this be a consistency object? Is, can this be the main object of, of meditation? Um, probably not, but give it a try. And again, if you find that you're, you're following a particular technique, um, or, or in this case, you're expanding the awareness of the breath to the whole body, and you're starting to get lost uh, more and more, then move to the, the focus on the individual point of the nostril or within the nostril, or the upper lip and so on. Um, 
Okay, I have a question regarding sustaining the practice. Sometimes the path gets uninspiring. I rationalize in my head that the Buddhist middle way is the best approach to liberation, but the practice can be dry and uninspiring. Any advice? Yes, stop making it uninspiring. You're doing this. It's not the Dhamma doing it. It's you. Um, so, <laughs> your, I uh, mentioned um, a couple of times now the importance of setting your mind up correctly at the beginning of a meditation. First step, any journey, and so on. And here it means the the uh, technical term here, yoniso manisikara, is like the way that you're framing, the way that you're understanding what you're doing and the purpose of what you're doing. And um, looking at meditation, um, framing the, the, the purpose and the, the aim and so on in such a way that is inspiring. So if you're finding it uninspiring, it means that you're uh, you're not doing that. So uninspiring means that you want something from meditation and you're disappointed that it's not giving it to you uh, or you're not getting what you want from meditation. So that's a particular way of thinking about meditation. I meditate in order to get something and if I get something I'm inspired and if I don't get it I'm uninspired. Um, and if you have a like a negative frame for meditation, then you know there's there's that confirmation bias kicks in, and uh, when things are difficult and defilements arise, then that reinforces the sense that this isn't working. Or maybe you think I can be mindful in daily life, and it's uh, a lot easier, and I'm good at it, and this is a waste of time, and. Um, a lot of hard work for very little result, and these kinds of thoughts um, lead us to uh, turn away from practice of meditation. So what I'm suggesting is that you think, how can I look at meditation, and how can I um, understand its role in my life, or the role I would like it to have in my life in a way that I find it uplifting and inspiring. The um, finding something dry and uninspiring is a sign of some um, negative, um, unwholesome dhamma in the, the dosa, the anger family. So the anger family covers, you know, from sort of red-faced rage all the way down to just the slightest kind of movement away from something. And within that dosa family, this uh, sense, oh, this is, uh, this is not doing it, this is boring, that's um, definitely within that category. So try to create some positive energy. Oh, what a wonderful opportunity to be able to practice like this. And bring the um, loving kindness metta into the practice for instance um, when you when you have recognized and isolated that feeling of metta and you can do that by bringing to mind something really cute like a cat a kitten or a puppy baby something like that and you just get kind of warm fuzzy feeling you know um, then apply that with the breath so you breathe in and you breathe and you're and you're having creating that kind of very positive feeling towards the breath it's like you're you're radiating loving kindness to your in breath and you're radiating loving kindness to the out breath so this is you can't find this in the Visuti mugga and um abhidhamma teachers would probably burst a blood vessel but it's something that you it works you you can try it it's a, just creating that very positive like un, unconditioned acceptance and love of your in breath and then of your out breath and you do it for a certain time until you just get over that kind of hump of 
of boredom and, and uh, dryness. And then you can put it down and just be with the breath maybe. So you need a whole toolbox of skillful means to, to deal with the problems. It's not that having no problems in meditation means you're a good meditator. Uh, meditation is about putting yourself in a space where you can look at problems and learn from them and transcend them. What would be the best practice for a person who has frequent outbursts of anger. Well, the first step is less frequent outbursts of anger. And then work from there. Okay, so anger is, um, has to be dealt with in three connected spheres, conduct, emotion, and thinking, uh, which correspond to sila, samadhi, banya and using different tools in each um, connected area. In the area of conduct, then we're using the power of renunciation, of restraint, of the decision that I will not express my anger in a way that is hurtful, harmful to others, either by body or sp actions or speech. So on the level of conduct, um, we are refraining from hurting, harming others. We're being willing just to be with the anger and not get it off your chest, or as they say. But that's obviously not enough. Um, the second um, connected area is of uh, emotions and so we systematically consistently cultivate the wholesome dhammas which directly oppose anger three key ones here are mindfulness patience and metta mindfulness is key because um, when we are sensitive to the changes in our uh, bodies and minds, then we have an early warning system before anger becomes uh, volcanic. We can observe certain patterns of arousal, certain areas of tension within the body that tend to, whatever the particular cause of the anger the kind of pattern of arousal which goes from just being normal to being angry um, is um, observable. And so we say, oh yeah, I'm just feeling this way in my arms or in my, in my shoulder or um, in my neck or wherever it is. This is, this is my early warning sign, I'm gonna get angry. And so you can cut it off very easily. Patience, if you do, get angry, um, then just being able to be with it and not express it or repress it. It's, this is anger, it's like this. And what an ugly thing it is, it's, this is anger. And it, it, it passes away, I mean you can't be angry for that long, but the um, the, the most important factor really is the, the thinking 
the ideas, the assumptions that lie behind the anger. For example, the idea that people should be a certain way and they shouldn't be another way or they should act in this way and they shouldn't. And I've told him a hundred times before, and why doesn't he? Um, and all the, uh, all the conclusions that you draw from that. So when somebody doesn't do what you want them to do, then you draw conclusions. He doesn't really love me, doesn't really care for me, doesn't really uh, interested in my feelings. And so, you know, it becomes um, a big drama. And that sense of self and injury to one's sense of self becomes overpowering. But if we change our way of looking, things happen because of all the causes and conditions that led up to an action. And we have to remind ourselves again and again, and I'm assuming this is true for, for most or all of you, that you don't know what's going on in someone else's head. Uh, you don't have that psychic power. You might have. If you do, well, I'd like to express my appreciation, but I'm a... I'm assuming you don't have this. So when you say they are so selfish or they're so stubborn or they're so this or they're so that or they're so insensitive, <laughs> these, are, um, these are conclusions that you are drawing from um, inadequate, incomplete data. To, you don't really know. And you usually put like, like the worst possible interpretation on um, people's actions when you're angry. So cool down and just look at what, what actually is going on here. What are the causes and conditions? And, um, you know, saying it should be like this, it shouldn't be like that. And, you know, when, once that, once you get thinking in that kind of way, you know, but it's my right, you know, and you to think about even, Human rights, you know, it's it's quite a um, valuable idea and one that's um, been of benefit to to many people. But it's also uh, can cause a lot of uh, unwise thinking about life. Now we don't have right, you know, to you don't have a right to be treated well. I mean, in terms of the nature of nature, you know, um, we can all decide that. Um, this should not occur, you know. You, um, when we call that a right, but it's 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 um, a right because we all agree it's a right, not because it's a law of nature. So when you when we have these conventions and agreements, and many of which are very skillful, um, intelligent conventions, but the the mistake we make is to confuse. A convention with a, a natural reality. So, um, in in summary, here I could go on at some some length, but uh, dealing with anger. First of all, do you really want to deal with anger? So you have to be clear with yourself about that. But, um, then it's a training, cultivation of conduct and speech by not expressing it in a way that's harmful to others, um, cultivating positive emotions, particularly a mental states of mindfulness, patience, loving kindness, and investigating the, uh, the causes and conditions and the thinking, the values, the assumptions, the premises that underlie this um, motion. So I got I got kind of press I can't say press gang really I I got invited a uh, surprise I got invited to a um, interfaith meeting and I I've managed to avoid interfaith meetings for forty years but I I I I couldn't get out of this one so. Uh, we're in this um, interface meeting and finding it very difficult to find common ground. And then I, I thought maybe 
we talk about anger, and maybe we all agree, whatever religion we we profess, that we all think uh, anger is not such a good thing, and we should try to be free of anger. And then, I, to my surprise, um, it wasn't accepted as a universal principle. <clears throat> and one of these religious teachers started talking about like righteous indignation and anger as in and and <clears throat> you know recognizing that 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 um, there's very ambiguous feelings about anger especially in in the western world whereas the idea of anger as being your fuel that you need um in a conflict between um powerful people and those without power. If you're without power, how do you sustain opposition to injustice um, when you have very little hope ever of making any change to the way things are? And so one of the most common responses to this is make anger. Anger keeps you going. Anger at the injustice, anger at the uh, cruelty. And, but from a Buddhist, Buddhist point of view, um, anger can only ever arise in the first place with wrong thinking and wrong understanding of a situation, of nature, the nature of things. Um, and that the more clearly you see, the less anger you feel but that there are alternative sources of inspiration and um, uh, and resilience to those who are faced by injustice, that anger is not a refuge, is never a good refuge, and that uh, equanimity and understanding the nature of things allows you to make the wisest choices. So it's not just not being angry and being left with this kind of bland um, indifference, but an understanding of how things change and what are the factors underlying change um, and applying oneself to those uh, in, with wisdom. You can't do that when, when you're angry. So yeah, it's just how to stop taking offense or taking the criticism from others personally. Any prescription to let go of past grudges. I, I'm going to be really blunt and honest here. Is that all right? I'm going to say that. Carrying grudges for years is pathetic. I mean, how can any intelligent person carry something like rotten and smelly and nauseous around in their mind for years on end? Why would you do that? You know? <laughs> yeah, don't do it, um, basically. Um, Um, okay, S taking criticism from others personally. Well, the, the more you invest in yourself as being a certain somebody, and 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 your the more that you your your sense of contentment and and well being um, is dependent on the opinions and the feelings of people around you, then the more vulnerable you're going to be um, when when people criticize you. So this one thing to, to bear in mind, you know, to what extent you it's important to you to be seen in a certain way and to be respected in a certain way. Um, and how willing are you to let go of that? Then the um, the other thing is that the more the criticism is uh, you know it's a pair with praise 
Um, and the more that you crave praise, the more painful you find criticism. So you can't just have like one without the other. You know, if you said, well, like, yeah, I like the praise, I just don't want the criticism. You can't, no, they, they go together. It's like two sides of one coin. So if you want the praise, you've got to um, grit your teeth and put up with the, with the criticism. But it, so if you want to uh, be less affected by criticism, then don't take praise so seriously. The, the more you um, investigate this, like the number one theme of Buddhist investigation um, is causality, how things change, the causes and conditions which um, lead to change, then um, the less you take things personally because um, you're assuming, you know, this fixed entity, me, and that fixed entity, them, and they are being nasty to you, or you and you, this is um, a misunderstanding of nature of things. And the only way to really unravel that is to look more and more closely at the body and mine. A uh, quick fix, if somebody criticizes you, don't deny it. Take it on and expand on it. This is a um, kind of judo move. Yeah. So somebody, so somebody says to you, how could you do that? How could you be so, you're such a selfish person. So, you know, if you're a, like a Buddhist, you know, that's really hurts, isn't it? Because, you know, you, you want to, you're trying to be unselfish. And how could people, how could anybody see, possibly see you as being, being selfish? Um, so hurtful. But don't think like that. So somebody says, um, you're so selfish. And you say, yeah, sometimes, sometimes I am. I'm really so, you know, sometimes I'm far more selfish than you know. You know, some of the selfish things, I, if you knew how selfish, I, you'd be shocked. You'd be really, you would just open your mouth and say, really, you know, I, I've been that kind of selfish in my life. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do something about it. And I, I'm, I'm sorry that this particular um, cases makes you feel that, that. Can you explain a little bit more about it to me? Yeah, so, and then can go into that. So that's kind of like speech yoga, speech, speech judo, not speech judo. Yeah. Basically, don't don't make don't be so serious about it all. You know, it's like. Um, grudge, yeah, I that's what we mean, grudge. I mean, if you hold a grudge, um, it's usually some small thing and um, you've made a big thing out of a small thing and you've said something to yourself, I'll never forgive him for that or I'll never, and then you just like curse yourself with that kind of thinking. And then it becomes like a matter of principle and... Um, just see the the psychological damage that you um, experience because of holding on to grudges, and also it can have a physical. Um, when you have these kind of not psychological like um, knots in your mind, then they can very well affect your you physically as well and long term physical problems. So it. It just doesn't make sense. It's it's uh, foolish. Let go. Never mind. I had a story that I thought I offended uh, my best friend, and and we were separated, and I. I went to India and, and wasn't in touch with him for about 
two years and I, I met him by accident and um, ended up moving into his flat, we shared a room, shared a flat together. And I was um, building up to the moment where finally after two years of feeling guilty and feeling bad about this, um, I could ask his forgiveness for what I'd done. And finally everything conspired, everything came together and, and very difficult, I was very emotional and I apologized and please don't hold this in. He couldn't remember. Yeah. <laughs> There's such a, like a big thing in my life, you know, for two years and, well, what? Really? You know. <laughs> so, you know, this is how, you know, holding on to things from the past, this is the kind of thing that happens. <coughs> well, how would you suggest to manage yourself and your thoughts if you have to face or deal with parents who are always stealing and lying to you. If you wish to remove yourself from them, would it be considered ungrateful? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I have some reservations about answering this kind of question because obviously I don't have all the information that I would need. Um, just by the way, if you're, anyone's sitting in the sun and you want to shift, please uh, shift into the shade, shadows and uh, to the shade. Um, and, um, you know, whether or not parents would see it in the same way, I, I don't know. But there are um, parents who treat their children badly, for sure. Just uh, let everyone move. Um, as, as regards one's debt of gratitude to, to parents, um, irrespective of how um, parents treat us later life, the very fact that we're alive in the first place and uh, grew up safe um, and reasonably healthy, um, is already an incredible um, debt of gratitude. The other um, point I think I, I often make people often overlook is like what would be the worst kind of the worst kind of handicap that a human being could have at birth or one that lasted through life. Um, and I would say it is lack of language. Let's say you, you had no inability to understand any language, an inability to speak any language. Can you imagine what that would be like to live a life? Unimaginable, I think. Um, so um, language, the acquisition of language, the ability to understand and to speak is one of the most um, unimaginably um, wonderful gifts, and that to that we owe our parents more than anybody else. We saw our mother tongue, you know, so mother and father. So um, putting the uh, the conduct of parents and sometimes the uh, very hurtful, harmful conduct of parents um, within a context and not to ex excuse it uh, or to diminish it, 
but see also see that that big picture. If if um, living together in a family, and whether it's parents and children or whoever, and it's it's a really toxic situation, and um, then um, leaving is is uh, I would I would think it's probably a good idea, and creating some space, and whether or not to return at some later date or not, but. Um, to, to be grateful to to parents doesn't mean to um, follow their every wish and desire. Um, that if uh, you are, let's say, your parents are bank robbers and they want you to uh, follow in the family line and they want to train you as a bank robber, and you say. Uh, I, I don't want to be a bank robber. Um, I want to be a school teacher. And they say, how ungrateful. After all we've done for you, you know. Um, then <laughs> I don't think that you should, you know, um, therefore give up your hopes of being a school teacher and become a bank robber in order to um, fulfill the virtue of filial piety. So there, there are higher standards, and, and which we receive from, from primarily from from the Buddha. And um, being close to someone, and and um, being in the same house, maybe it's not such a good idea for certain relationships, and needs some space. So if you if your your feeling is your parents are treating you very badly and can't see any. Um, likelihood of that changing, then I, I wouldn't think it's ungrateful to, uh, to move away. Okay, in regards to right speech or noble silence, could you please elaborate on what you meant by getting things off your chest? May not be the right analogy, it could actually be putting more on your chest. Okay, so what I meant by that is, um, you know, we have this uh, analogy, you know, you have this kind of stuff built up here and then you just get it off your chest and now now you're all right, you know. But um, what I think actually happens is that every time you do that, then you create, uh, you, you strengthen the likelihood of having to do that again in the future. And you never develop any more intelligent ways of dealing with this um, mental states, mental phenomena. And so every time you have some discomfort, then you have this kind of um, automatic reaction, just want to uh, shout at somebody or, or let things go. And, and, um, but every, every intentional action is karma. It strengthens a particular habit. So every time you you um, follow an, um, what I would say is an unskillful habit, then you are strengthening that habit. And so you get stuff off your chest, but that means then before long there'll be more on your chest that you have to deal with, and then you get rid of it, and, and so on and so forth. So it's not a, um, I don't think, a very skillful means of dealing with the sense of tension and, and um, um, just wanting something to go away. Uh, how can one see devas and nagas? Um, you can go to one of the big temples in Bangkok and go into the poster hall and on the walls. They have so many. I'm not sure whether they're photographs or pictures, but the um, question is why, why would you want to see devas and nagas? Um, again, with 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 um, meditation practice, it's very 
important not to get sidetracked or to want to get something or to be something or to see something um, because that will um, lead to a distortion of the meditation and craving and this unwholesome desire replaces chanda or wholesome intelligent desire. And so that's a, a sidetrack at best and can be um, lead to a serious obstacle. If you have a, um, a well-stocked memory of images um, concerning devas and nagas, then also your unconscious can sometimes create these images and seem very realistic. And so you can um, get caught up with that whole realm. So I don't think it's a very, um, very good kind of uh, path to follow. So devas, um, monks or, or meditators who can, can see devas or nagas or beings from other realms um, are those who've developed very uh, profound levels of samadhi. So their minds are much more sensitive. Or maybe you should say like they have a bigger bandwidth than um, most people. Uh, so they, they are aware of, they can um, see or hear beings from other realms. But most of the 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 monks, you know, who have these kind of powers, they're very reluctant to talk about them in in most cases, and because they don't want people, they're fascinating, they're interesting, um, and that's the lure of the the fascination, the fascinating, the. Um, so I, I, in the, um, the teachings on right view, the Buddha gives two levels of right view as the worldly level, mundane level, and the lokuttara, or transcendent level. And one of the premises, one of the um, teachings that one takes on trust or as a working hypothesis um, in the um, mundane right view category is the existence of what we call opapatika beings. Um, and that would include devas, for instance. So there is um, a take on trust, the existence of devas and can share merit with devas um, and can um, aspire to the virtues of devas, but uh, wanting to see them, um, well, um, what would be the value with regards to the practice to Abandon the unwholesome, develop the wholesome, and purify the heart. Not, not, not a clear-cut thing, I think. So I would say, don't worry about it. But if your samadhi becomes very strong, maybe you have that kind of good karma that you might be able to see these things these beings. Um, <clears throat> Dirajan, may I know what are the causes for jhana, please? Okay, so um, jhana is, is a name for a um, level or different levels of samadhi and samadhi as 
I have stated a few times is the result of stable, unbroken stream of mindfulness. So initially, um, the practice is to develop mindfulness using an object as a means to stabilize the mindfulness. Samadhi um, begins where the five hindrances end. Now when the five hindrances of sensual desire and ill will, slots and torpor, agitation, worry, skeptical doubt, <clears throat> these no longer appear in the mind, then this is the state of samadhi. And um, as <clears throat> one continues to practice, then the um, jhana factors of vitaka, vichara, so initial sustained application of thought, rapture, bliss, and um, unity of mind um, become stronger and stronger. And they reach a certain level of maturity, and then we can call that jhana. And then there's an evolution of the mind, which may or may not take place, and the mind may reach um, that particular level. But the, the principle underlying the evolution of the um, focused, unified mind is that the coarser elements fall away. So in, uh, initially, it's the rapture. There's, there's some kind of um, coarseness to rapture, which falls away. And then the, uh, even the bliss falls away until um, the mind is in a state of um, equanimity and mindfulness. So these, this is it's the mind, it's all the mind, but um, can talk about an evolution of the mind and, and group factors, and we call this group of factors um, by this name, and then there's a change, and we call it that name. But it, and these are just applying names to mental phenomena. And so Ajahn Chah, uh, my teacher, would um, rarely speak in, in this technical language of jhanas, but he would um, stress knowing what is present in the mind. Is you can't you can't know a jhana. You know you can't. It's not an object of knowledge or awareness. What you can know is the mental factors which constitute a jhana. You know. So if you didn't know the jhana term, you know you could experience jhana um, because without without knowing, only afterwards. Oh, if if it's like this, like this, we call it this. Um, but what we're really um, interested in is this. Uh, cultivation of the mind and allowing the mind to follow this uh, this evolution. So based upon sila, uh, one develops mindfulness, mindfulness matures into samadhi, um, and samadhi provides the foundation for uh, the penetration of the three characteristics, the work of wisdom. <laughs> I'm not going to read this one out. <laughs> um, so someone complaining about the uh, the behavior of um, people sitting nearby and that they're making noises that are disturbing them. Can't hear what I'm saying. But this this is meditation, you know. <laughs> This, this is what it's about. It's not just about what's happening, um, you know, when you close your eyes, but 
Um, what happens when you hear a sound that you don't like? You know, that, that's, that's what we're learning, isn't it? What, what, what is it that creates that aversion and that mental reaction? And how can you protect yourself against that? How, how can you look at what's happening? How can you uh, establish mindfulness in such a way that it's not a big deal? Because once you get uh, that kind of sensitive to people moving and, and cushions and creaking and coughing and sneezing and you know, there's, there's always a hundred people. There's always going to be some kind of noise. Um, it's sort of like how, how much importance you give to it. If you want this completely silent, still um, environment, then better not to go on a retreat. Better just to meditate at home in a in a in a dark room. But this is this is part of it. Like in a you know, in the red meditation retreat, there's nothing that's not part of the retreat. Nothing. Um, every single thing that happens is a challenge. So you know, so I, well, it's not the kind of challenge I want. You know, I, I I want this challenge. I don't want. Well, you can't choose. So we have um, we have agreements, and of course, I mean, encourage everyone as a to encourage everyone yesterday to be aware. I mean, we, we have a, the, the meditation hall is really packed um, for this retreat. <clears throat> if it's, um, you know, if, it, if you're really feeling constricted and too much, then uh, you can also sit downstairs. <coughs> um, there's, um, we have TVs with, uh, you can see me on a screen. Um, but otherwise, it's how can my effort is not to allow defilement to arise in my mind and to deal wisely with defilement does arise, to bring wholesome dhammas into my mind, to, um, to develop those that are already there. Um, so if someone is making a noise, and please, uh, everyone, try to make as little noise as possible, be mindful. Um, if somebody does make a noise, then how can you prevent your mind from reacting to that? Um, you develop some metta for for people, and you know, it's, uh, ask yourself: when people make make noise <clears throat> in a meditation hall, are they doing it deliberately? Like, are they infiltrators? Like fifth columnists? They've come to uh, don't like Ajahn Jayasara. I'm going to mess up his retreat. I'm going to go and sit in the middle of this hall and make noises so people say, never again, Ajahn Jayasara retreat, so noisy. Uh, I, I, I don't think anyone's, you know, anybody's doing this deliberately, are they? Um, so it's, it's not deliberate. And people are, some people are clumsy and some people are not very um, grounded in their body. They're up in their head, you know, and that's, that's the way people are sometimes. And, yeah, it would be nice if they weren't, but you know that's that's how it is right now. So so yeah. So one side of it is asking everyone to be mindful and, and quiet, as quiet as you can be, and not making unnecessary noises. But for for everyone else, it's how can you deal with that? And so, like the that bird so loud this morning. You know, it's this. It's called gawal. It's a gawal bird. It's a go wow, go wow. And, but, you know, natural noises are not, you know, if, if that had been uh, one of the retreatants standing outside going go wow, go wow, I think you'd probably be a lot more upset. <laughs> now, that's not a go wow, that's, that's, a, you know, that's, that's a peacock, so it's a different. But why, why would it be so different, you know, that sort of ear splitting noise of a bird and then, knowing that there was somebody standing behind that door going, go, wow, just to sort of upset us. Why, why would it be so different if the impact on your ear was the same? You know, so you can see what you add to this impact. And so like with, with bird sounds, there's easy fix for that one. You know, you just impose, so like, go, wow, just imagine that's butoh, you see. 
And after two or three times, it just, it just, you, you hear it as butto, and it's actually a kind of a meditation prompt. So deal, deal with these things uh, skillfully. Uh, when I meditate, many times my body will move or even shake. Feels like a muscle spasm. Is this normal? Any advice, please? Yeah, it's not abnormal. It's it's certainly not anything to to worry about, and um, it it can occur for a certain period of time, and and then it just disappears by itself. It's quite common. Um, otherwise, it can be a indication of some. Um, sort of lack of, you see now it's laughing, um, like that joke just now. The, um, uh, it's, it can be a physical thing rather than, you know, a, a function of meditation practice. And, and that's why you recommend yoga and qigong and tai chi and these uh, forms of exercise which um, promote this flow of, of prana or chi in the body um, because um, this kind of spasm sometimes is just like a energy blocks in, in the body. It's a physical thing um, rather than a, um, a meditation uh, phenomena. So one, be, be assured it's not, it's not weird, it's not abnormal, uh, happens number of people it's not dangerous not physically um, dangerous um, and um, put a little more more effort into physical exercise particularly the um, yoga qigong kind of exercise not just like muscular um, aer aerobic exercise but exercise that has um, a an effect on the whole flow of energy within the body Uh, may I have actionable tips? Well, that's a good word, isn't it? On, on how can one can be a sotapanna, please. Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's just it's, it's no different from the actionable tips I've I've given already. It's just the same thing. It's just like a bit further along the road. You now we're talking about how to develop. Um, mindfulness or samadhi and banya, you know, this is, this is uh, um, carrying on this way. Um, five precepts is absolute necessity. You cannot um, um, realize stream entry unless you have a very strong foundation of sila. And practice, yeah, there's no kind of special, you know, I, I was um, speaking to someone just now about the uh, practice as a layperson and, and the Buddha's words um, in which he proclaimed that I, have, I don't have the closed fist of certain teachers. Uh, and what he meant by that is that certain teachers will have uh, sort of teachings they give to everyone, public teachings, and then these special kind of esoteric teachings for the initiates, like right, the inner core, um, the special disciples. And the Buddha said that he doesn't teach that way. You know, you have these principles of Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, and um, anyone can apply. Um, if there's a difference between the monastics and lay people is that monastic life is uh, established by the Buddha um, in order to provide the most conducive conditions for practice. So for a layperson, you're doing exactly the same things um, uh, overall, but in more difficult circumstances. Um, but it's not a different practice. But for um, lay Buddhists, I've been saying this a few times today, <clears throat> so the Buddha, uh, said, if you compare all the suffering that we've endured in samsara in the past to all the 
earth, in the world, in this planet, then the suffering that remains for the sotapanna is equivalent to the amount of dirt you could get under the nail. So that much. So my own analogy, if you can imagine a, um, a road, a thousand kilometer road from nowhere to Nibbana, okay, if you realize stream entry, it's like 999.999 meters of the road to Nibbana. And once there, you are um, definitely going to realize Nibbana seven lifetimes at most, and probably not so much. So it's one, one practice, and starting off from from where you are right now. And there's no special kind of Sotapanna practice or no special Arahant practice or that's not there in the, um, in the Four Noble Truths and Eightfold Path. It's all there, all that you need to know. It's just a matter of applying it steadily and consistently. So five precepts, eight precepts um, on full moon days or whenever you have some uh, time to spend time in the monastery, meditation retreats, um, practice, look, learn, um, learn from your experience. And that's, that's the way ahead. So that's the Q&A session for this afternoon. I'm going to end at this point.